We moved from an apartment into a house when I was 12 years old. The house had three bedrooms, a large beige one for my parents, a small blue one for my middle sister and I, and an even smaller pink one for my older sister. We repainted the room I shared with my sister to light purple because that was her favorite color. The house had a huge attic that overlooked a large garden. The garden was actually on one side of the house, and the only windows that faced the garden were in the attic. I often wondered why the original owner put so much work into making this garden. Hidden from the street by a wall of tall hedges, the garden can't be seen from the street or from inside the house without the exception of through the attic windows. The garden had an oval in the middle of the grass with flowers around a stone birdbath. Each corner of the garden had a flowering shrub like lilacs, roses, and hydrangeas. The garden seemed creepy to me, and every time I looked out those attic windows, I felt like something was looking back at me from the flower patch and birdbath. I later found out that the older man who lived there might have spent a lot of time in the attic since my parents found his large pornography stash from the 1950s hidden under some floorboards. My older sister had a white teddy bear that she kept on her bed. Some mornings, when she woke up, the teddy bear would be on the chair at her desk across the room. She never put the bear there. She found it strange because she was a sound sleeper and never budged from her bed at night. My middle sister and I were arguing a lot, so my mother made me move into my older sister's room, and my older sister took my place, sharing a bedroom with our middle sister. The first few nights, I didn't sleep well. I knew something was waking me up every night, but I didn't know what. On my fourth night there, I woke up to see a girl, about eight or nine years old, in a pale pink or beige nightdress, standing at the foot of the bed, smiling at me. She was wearing a nightgown that looked like it was from 50 years ago, frilly and old-fashioned. She had curly brown hair, and although I was scared to see this apparition at the foot of my bed, I got the feeling she wanted to play. When I was finally brave enough to reach out to touch her, she disappeared. After that scary experience, I decided that sharing a room with my middle sister is much better than sharing a room with a ghost. When I returned to my original bedroom, I told my middle sister that I think there's a ghost in her older sister's room, but before I could tell her what happened, my middle sister said that a few months ago she was using the bathroom in the middle of the night, and when she left the bathroom, she saw the faint image of a little girl with curly brown hair standing in the doorway to our older sister's bedroom. She described the little girl ghost who looked exactly the same as what I saw. One afternoon, when my middle sister and I were 15 and home alone because our older sister and parents were at work, we decided to play with an old Ouija board we found in the basement. We thought if this board really worked, maybe we would be able to speak with the little girl ghost and find out why she was there and if she meant us any harm. It started out innocently enough. We asked the usual questions, is anyone here? And the pointer moved to yes. Then we asked if the spirit was a girl or a boy, and it said, Girl, we asked, What is your name? And the pointer slowly and gently moved to M, then E, then L, A, N, I, and finally E. Hmm, I thought. So she's a little girl named Melanie. Interesting. I don't know anyone named Melanie. I'm not sure why we did this, but we then asked if there was anyone else there. Suddenly, the pointer moved faster and differently than before and pointed to yes. We asked, what is your name? It quickly moved to G, then A, then B, then E. The pointer seemed to be moving angrily and forcefully. Our hearts began to beat faster with fear. What started out to be just some silly teens playing a game suddenly turned scary and felt real. This seemed like an evil, angry spirit. We asked, who are you? Are you angry? The pointer tip moved back and forth quickly and violently, so I removed my hands, but it kept moving as if someone was pulling the tip where no one was touching it. My sister took her hands off of it too, and it took a few seconds to stop moving. I don't know why we did this because I was terrified, but I followed my sister's lead, and when it stopped moving, we both put our hands back on it, and my sister asked, Are you still here? Where are you? Pointer turned slowly and pointed towards the wall the windowless wall that on the other side 
had the creepy garden I mentioned earlier. It slowly began to travel toward the wall and the end of the board. Terrified, my sister and I removed our hands from the pointer. It continued to move down the board onto the thick, plush carpet, slowly dragging itself over the carpet for about two feet before it finally stopped. My sister and I sat, frozen in fear, our hearts pounding in our chest. The pointer had moved by itself over two feet, slowly onto plush carpet, never once changing speed until it suddenly stopped. We sat there for a while, paralyzed with fear. Eventually, we summoned the courage to put the board back in the box and returned it to the basement and never spoke of it again. Years go by and my older sister moves out. Dad and I repainted her bedroom to blue and I prepared to move into it. I had read that if you personalize a home or space, the ghost won't recognize it as theirs and move on. Foolish of me to believe that, but I was a teenager, so it made sense to me. My father and I replaced the original wooden board under the threshold of the bedroom door. When we pried up the old one and turned it over, written in pencil, was Melanie's room. I didn't tell my father, a religious man, about the Ouija board incident because I knew he would be mad that not only did we find a Ouija board in the basement, but we actually played with it. I still moved into that room because my father and I worked so hard on redecorating it for me, and I wasn't about to tell him what my middle sister and I had done. But for the duration that I lived there, at least once a week, my teddy bear that I kept on my bed would be found the next morning on the chair at the desk across the room, which is not where I ever left it. I was fine with the ghost of Melody moving it or playing with it, as long as that scary gay spirit never joined her. I never did see a male ghost or anything else. Perhaps he really does live in that creepy garden the pointer indicated. It was a bone chilling Friday night, 41 years ago, when I was just 11 years old. My friends and I had just finished hockey practice at 6.30. Our coach Matt reminded us to enjoy our rare weekend off and to be back for practice on Monday at 5 p.m. As we left the rink at 6.45, we split into groups based on our neighborhoods. Mark, Brian, Jeff, and I lived in the same apartment complex and walked home together. We took the shortest route over the old closed train trestle. On our way, we saw Brian's brother Damon and his friends heading to their high school hockey game. Damon mentioned that they had left a fire burning in a barrel next to the train tracks and asked us to put it out before we left the area. When we reached the top of the trestle, the fire was still burning and felt so warm. We decided to sit down and talk for a few minutes. Huddled close to the barrel at the edge of the bridge, we talked about our plans for the next day. We were talking about going to the arcade in the mall when suddenly we heard a little girl's voice coming from behind the barrel saying, I want to go. Terrified, we grabbed our gear and ran towards home as fast as we could. Our hearts were pounding as we ran through the dark woods. What usually took 10 minutes felt like it took forever. When we finally made it to our apartment complex, there were police everywhere. My mom was crying on her front porch, and when she saw me, she grabbed me, hugged me, and started cursing at me. It was now 11.45. We had left the rink at 6.45. My parents kept screaming at me, asking me, what have we been doing? I told them everything, how we walked over the train trestle, sat by the fire for maybe 10 minutes, heard a little girl's voice, and ran home scared. But my mom said that the police had checked that entire route, and they didn't see us or the fire. Nobody believes us to this day. But that wasn't the end of it. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I heard that little girl's voice saying, I want to go. And then I started seeing her, a ghostly figure standing at the foot of my bed. She never spoke again, but just stood there, watching me. Watching me with her empty eyes.
The next day, I tried to talk to Mark, Brian, and Jeff about what had happened, but they didn't want to talk about it. They seemed scared, too, but wouldn't admit it. So I was left alone with my fear. I was trapped in my own nightmare. Needless to say, my weekend off was spent in terror in my room instead of at the arcade in the mall.